Um, David's session, I'm live blogging David's session. It will be followed on the Fun Change Camp Wiki on the site. And on my site, which is on the very six of the Awesome. So that's great, because there was one thing I was going to ask if, if somebody would mind with I am live session. Blogging. That's perfect. OK. So let's get started. Um, Here's the big change. Here's the big, the, the different world that we're in. This is a, a, one of my favorite pictures. This is a picture that was created by the Occupy Project in 2004. <coughs> this is a picture of the internet. And what I love about this, and I, you know, I don't think I need to explain this t too much to you guys, but what I love about this is it kind of shows us two things. This is like a brand new space where people are meeting and falling in love and entertaining each other and, and finding out things about one another. And we're having, we're into a brand new kind of space where we kind of figure out where does, where's the public space in there? Like, where does, where does government fit? Where does governance fit? Where does public policy kind of fit? And I, the other thing that I think this is really in, indicative of is the way that the, the interconnections that our world is kind of seeing really, really over and over and over again. And public policy problems aren't ones that we can really deal with in simple, simple ways anymore. Legislation doesn't necessarily take care of problems, right? If you think about things like climate change, think about things like well, uh, health and wellness, you think about things like safer streets, there's this all this interconnectedness that makes doing public policy really challenging, I think really exciting, and possibly incredibly creative. But the opportunity here is to try and weave these things, sort of weaving these things together. And, you know, this this thing called the web is, has real power now, right? We, I don't think I need to tell this story either. This is the, the inauguration of Barack Obama, and this is a a story that has caught the attention of governments around the world. And they're following the Obama administration really closely, and they're looking at ways in which the, the, this can, uh, can impact the way that they work. I think the, the amazing thing that's happening now is it's no longer about why do we need the internet to do public policy differently. It's now about how do we do it. So that's an impressive thing. And, I, and of course, I can't, I'm going to mention this too. This is an amazing, amazing example um, that we're seeing right now, a live experiment in the power of people coming together to, to change the world around them. So that's obviously a real inspiration. But the, here's the challenge, right? We've got, we've got a, a, a public policy process that is not really built for that, for, for that web, for, for these kinds of different events, for this, the kind of policy challenges that we're all facing, right? Um, and this, Sometimes this stuff, this stuff can work, and, 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 I, and what I want to say right off the bat is, like, some of the stuff that we do in, in this kind of mode works well and is really, really appropriate. I'm a fan of some of it, right? But there are limits, right? And, and I think what we need to begin to explore is what those, what those limits are. And so, you know, what we kind of see when we, do, when we do collaboration, right, is, is three things. We see people sharing views, we see people deliberating about what to do about them, and then we talk about how action can happen after that, right? And governments, to this point, most of the time, the conventional idea of, of consultation has been, we get your views, and then we'll go in the back room, and we'll sort it, we'll do the deliberate, deliberation, and then we're going to act on them. What we've, we're starting to see now is opening up that deliberative process, right? So that people can become part of the sorting of the information about what's important, what's not, where our values are, where they're not, what, what should we do? But oftentimes, the responsibility for action still falls on government. And that becomes a problem, because from government's perspective, when you're looking at this kind of deliberative process, sometimes stuff comes out of it that you can't do anything. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, when those, all those recommendations could drop out of a consultative process, even a deliberative process, the question you've got to ask yourself is, well, we want government to do this, but what's stopping us from making these things happen? Why can't we take action? And how do we coordinate with one another to start, to start getting really creative solutions to policy goals. So here's the other thing that I, I need to mention. This is a really important driving initiative behind what's going on in the BC government right now. This is, we have, one of the things that I think my boss um, has done that is really smart. Um, Who is your boss? Oh, okay, by the way. So my name is David Hume. I'm the Executive Director for Citizen Engagement um, in the Ministry of Citizen Services. So under the minister? Under the minister, Ben uh, Stewart. I'm glad you can remember his name. Yeah, he's new, so it's something new. Um, ben Stewart is MLA for... You know what? I don't Kona know. Kona, thank you, Christine. Yeah. So your boss, that's, that's who you mean? That's, well, actually, no. I, I, um, my boss is Kim Henderson, who's okay. now the deputy of, okay. the, of Citizen Services. 
she, prior to being becoming deputy over there, was inside the Premier's office in a place called the Workforce Planning and Leadership Secretariat. Oh, yes. And that was looking at how we, we deal with this, okay? So let me let me go there if that's a satisfactory yeah, answer. No, I'm okay. just trying to clarify the university for us. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that she did is she commissioned some actuaries to have a look at how the workforce is going to be changing in, in, in British Columbia. And what, uh, in, in the BC Public Service specifically. And what you see is that what it looks like, what could happen in the next 10 years, is that the BC Public Service could shrink by as much as 30%. And that's not because people, just so I'm clear, are getting fired, okay? That's because there's nobody out there that's gonna come and fill those positions. As retirements happen, as we, and we don't, we don't have enough immigrants coming in, we don't have enough people in school who are gonna be qualified to, to do this stuff. And so what could happen is we get, within 10 years, we could have a million more British Columbians, and we could have a public service that could be about the same size as it was in 1970. So, how do you do government in that kind of situation? Yeah. Sorry, what is the red line? The red line is, po is population. So, here's the relative size. Mm -hmm. Here's the here's the size of the public service in each of those each of those di different decades. Here's the, the levels that they, that they were at, right? And here's how they project up to 20, 2016. And then that's the population coming up to, to five million. Is that is that clear? Yeah. So it's, it's like the this year talking about it's like service delivery. Service delivery, well, think about education, yeah. health, right? Like, where's the people, right? You need people. So you're saying that's not positions, that's filled positions. That's filled positions. So yeah. where does the positions line continue up at the same? Well, this is the issue, right? Like, we're, what you would expect is, what we, in the best of all possible roles, right, you'd be, be able to get people there to do serve that extra million population. Right? Yeah. But we don't know that we're going to be able to get those people. So that's a big driver for us. Is that just because of money? Like, because of money? Pardon me? Is it because of money or just people aren't there? No, people aren't there. Like, they're retired, they're not working. There's there's a hugely tight labor, going to be a hugely tight labor market. Other people are going to be com competing for, for individuals to come and work for them. So the BC Public Service might not be able to hire those kind of people into those positions. Well, I was just going to say, it also has to do with the nature of public service. Like, people went into public service as a career in the 70s. Now, with uh, our generation of people, we like to move around. And so what's happening is that people get trained in the public service, how there's a great resume building and then jump ship somewhere else. So it has to do with, you know, how do we adapt and we use people, to, we use people for where they are and the skills that they can provide in any way. Um, well, I'm, my, so I'm not opposed to reducing the amount of bureaucracy in government. Great. But can we look at it as an opportunity for citizens' engagement? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Supported by technology. If you don't have people, become more efficient and more productive. Here we go. And well, use let's, these let's, people. Let's, 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 let's start talking about this. Let's have a session on this topic. Let's have a session on this topic. So let's, let's, let's talk about what, what, what this means. Right? So what, what, if we start talking about citizen engagement as, an answer, as part of the answer to this problem, right? what do we think it can do? Okay. We think, here's, well, here's what I think, and you tell me what you think. I think that we, if we do policy in a more open way, we'll, our needs will better match resources. So we start doing more of the right things and less of the wrong things. Sorry, before you go, I'm sure, on the previous slide, what do you mean, what was the, what do you mean by policy judgment? Oh, sorry, did I, I, I skipped over one. Sorry. Okay, so, sorry, here we go. This is what I meant to say. Here, what can we do, okay? So we can do policy, right? This is sort of the conventional world of how do we make decisions about the future? And what do we? Well, and what should we do about particular issues, right? I think we can also look at how we can involve users of services in the in the design of those services, and in how it maybe even in delivering them, delivering them. There's a really amazing example out of the U.S. called the Peer to Patent Process, uh, Project, where the U.S. Peer Patent Office has does well. Obviously, they they accept patent applications, and part of that process is how how the, the determination of prior art. And that's a really, really research intensive portion of the patent approval process. So what they've done is they've opened up that part of the, of the patent approval process to a community of citizen researchers, scientists, engineers that are going and doing some of the research that's required to do an assessment of prior art to see if it's a new innovation, a new thing. Um, and that's helping to drive down some of the backlog 